Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Palm Sunday, First Prez family. It's good to be together this Sunday on Palm Sunday. Uh, and I have a confession to make this Palm Sunday. I am somebody who likes to be in the know. Some might call it being nosy. <laughs> Are there any nosy people in this room? Anyone can relate to that? Ah, yes, thank you, honest people. Uh, my husband can attest to this. I am often kind of spying on him, slash if he's texting someone, I'm always like, who are you texting? And he's like, it's none of your business. <laughs> or he's writing an email or doing some work. I'm like, what are you doing right now? He's like, none of your business. <laughs> I'm someone who likes to be in the know. I like to know what's going on with other people. I like to know what's going to happen. I like to kind of predict when surprises might happen so that I won't have to be surprised. I like to be in the know. And as I was thinking about it this morning, I like to be in the know because I like to be in control. I like to be able to know what to expect, and to have it come through, and to feel like a sense of control through that whole process, to know that what I thought was going to happen was going to happen. And so even this morning, as we came in on Palm Sunday, I'm sure many of us, if you grew up in the church or have been in a Palm Sunday service before, you probably had certain expectations. You probably expected to sing a song about Hosanna with the word Hosanna in it. Maybe some of you expected a processional with palms, maybe even a processional with kids. I'm sure most of you didn't expect a drum line, <laughs> unless you read Jake's email and you saw that that was coming. But that was probably a new experience for some of us, and I know that I personally really enjoyed that. Um, but this morning, as we are here on Palm Sunday, for me, as I was reflecting and preparing for this sermon, I had this strong sense that God wanted to surprise us to defy our expectations, to put a new spin on this Palm Sunday story for us. And so today I want to share with you a story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, a story that might be familiar for a lot of us. But I want to present it not as a triumphal entry, but as an untriumphal entry, an act of protest, and nonviolent resistance against the Roman Empire. Sound interesting? <laughs> Let me read this text for us. The text for today is from Luke. Oh, wrong passage up there. <laughs> it's from um, Luke chapter 20. Um, let's see, 19. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> and um, this text is actually from the lectionary text this week. Um, and I'll be reading this for us together. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethpage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, 
order your disciples to stop? And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Let me pray for us as we begin this sermon today. Jesus, we do thank you for who you are. And we thank you that you are one who's constantly surprising us. Would you open our hearts? Would you open our minds? Would you open our ears? So that we might hear your voice clearly today. And would we get a new picture of who you are? So that we might worship you more fully. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So today's text, as I mentioned, is from the lectionary from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. Uh, Many of us have heard these words before. And Jesus, at the beginning of this passage, it says that he is making his way towards Jerusalem. He's setting his way to go to Jerusalem. And at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, earlier on in um, previous chapters, Jesus had talked about this. He's on this long road on the way to Jerusalem. And right before this chapter in Luke 18, Jesus actually makes this statement, this prediction, that he's going to go to Jerusalem and that he's actually preparing to die, that he's actually preparing to be crucified. And so this passage says... um, to the next slide. Hmm. Oh, there we go. So this is a little map. And the passage, says, the passage says that when he had come near Bethpage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent his, two of his disciples. And many of us heard, have heard this before. You know, he sends his disciples. He says, go in the village and you're going to find this colt. Some passages say a donkey with its colt. Some say a colt, some say a donkey. So there's different kind of versions of this. But um, regardless, you know, in every passage, in every story, he sends his disciples to go into this village to find this donkey or colt, donkey and colt. And um, basically he's borrowing (laughs) this animal that belongs to who knows. (laughs) We don't know who owns this donkey. Um, And it specifically says a colt that has never been ridden. So we can assume that it's probably a young animal that's never been ridden before. And he says, untie it, bring it here. And he has this whole thing where he says, if they ask you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. And this is what happens. Um, They go into the village. They find this animal. They they untie it. They're going to take it. And they're like, what are you doing? Why are you taking this colt? And they say, the Lord needs it. And so like, like, okay, I guess, I don't, we don't really know what their response is. But we know that they bring the animal back. This this, uh, this donkey or colt, and um, they put their cloaks on it, and Jesus starts riding down the road. So you can see on the map here, um, Bethany and Bethpage, they're kind of up in the corner and um, on the right side of the screen, and he's going towards the Mount of Olives, down this path towards Jerusalem, to the center of Jerusalem where the temple is. And as he does so, his disciples are laying cloaks on the road, This version actually doesn't say that they're waving palms, but we know that in many of the other versions, there's a waving of palms. And they're crying out, shouting and praising Jesus, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. How many of you have heard this story before in some form? Raise your hand. So a lot of us. Now I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine that as Jesus is coming down from uh, Bethany and Bethpage, down towards the Mount of Olives, towards Jerusalem, imagine that as he's making his way, he's kind of having this whole procession, that every year, at the very same time, there was another procession happening. Because you see, every year, any time that it was going to be Passover, the Roman governor of this province of Judea, every year he knew that when Passover happens, all these Jews would be coming into Jerusalem from all over. 
the number of Jews was estimated to grow from about 50,000 to 200,000 at that time, near Passover. So it was just this huge influx of people. The Jewish community would come. It would be this huge feast, and Passover was a huge part of the Jewish culture and community. And so the Roman um, rulers at that time, they knew that every time Passover came, they had to make their stand. They had to make their statement. And so every year, there would also be a Roman procession that would happen at the same time that this actual um, entry of Jesus was happening. And this Roman procession was quite different. You can imagine that it was quite different than what we know of Jesus' procession. The Roman governor would come in on a huge military horse. There would be tons and tons of soldiers, fully armed in all of their um, gear with their swords and shields. They would have, be waving their banners, the banners of the Roman Empire. Uh, and, you know, the, the ruler of... Uh, Judea at the time, the Roman governor would come in on a horse. They would often have a big pole with an eagle mounted on the pole. <laughs> and it was this huge, as you can imagine, this huge, triumphant, military procession. You hear this, imagine the sounds that you would hear of clinking metal and armor and kind of the shouts of all these soldiers and the marching of their boots and the the neighing of the horses coming through, and it was this huge processional of Roman military might. And the Roman governor did this on purpose every year because he knew that the Jews were coming into town and he knew that he had to make his presence known. He knew that he had to say, Rome is in charge. We got the power. We got the might. You better bow down to us and you better not try anything funny. He had to make his presence known with this huge military processional. And so it's interesting to think about this processional happening at the same time. And oftentimes, in that time, in the Roman culture, um, you know, they would say, Hail Caesar! And they would say, Caesar is Lord. They would worship Caesar, basically, as um, they believed that he was the son of God. And so to say, Hail Caesar! Save us! You know, worshiping kind of the Roman emperor was their way of kind of setting um, the Roman rulers as God, as divine, as the ones that they were worshiping. So imagine, as this crazy Roman processional is happening, Jesus is coming in. They're coming from the west, from the western capital, kind of this luxurious coastal estate. He would be coming in from the western side, into Jerusalem with all of his fanfare, with all of his army, with all of his horses, with all of his might. And at the same time, from the other side, Jesus is coming in towards Jerusalem. And Jesus is not riding on a majestic military horse. He's riding on a donkey. One that's never been ridden. One that doesn't even belong to him. Jesus is coming not with armor and gear and swords and shields, but he's coming with just cloak spread on the road and cloak spread on the animal. He doesn't even have an actual saddle to ride in, just a cloak to cover the donkey. And imagine that this crowd around Jesus, it's not a crowd, it's not a legion of soldiers, it's not a bunch of Roman military uh, folks, it's actually the poor, the peasants, they're ethnic minorities, they're the oppressed, Imagine Jesus is not talking about the imperial power of Rome, but he's talking about the peaceable kingdom of God. And imagine that they're not waving the banner of Rome, but they're waving palms, a symbol of peace, a symbol of victory. And Jesus and his followers, they call not on Caesar to save, but they call on the true king of kings. As we think about these processions, for me, I, I think about how Jesus must have known exactly what he was doing. This procession, the Roman procession that happened every year, was not new. And so for Jesus to plan his own procession, his anti-triumphal entry, was a way of putting a middle finger in the face of Rome. It was. 
It was a way of saying, Caesar is not Lord, I am. I don't need those horses and those swords and shields. I come in peace and humility. I come not to dominate and to show my power and might. I come with service. I come with humility. I come with sacrifice. I come in love. And I don't need a legion of soldiers around me to prove how great I am. I have these people, the poor, the peasants, the minorities. These are the ones that I've come to serve, to save, and to deliver. And as Jesus enters into Jerusalem this way, he fulfills the prophecy of Zechariah. He says, tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. Jesus commands peace to the nations, and he says, he is Lord, not Caesar. He is a king of peace, not a king of military might. No more chariots, no more war horses, no more bows, no more war in this land. This is the king that we worship, the true king of kings. Amen? Now, as I was reflecting on Jesus' actions this week, I was reminded of this picture of a young woman named Aisha Evans. How many of you have seen this picture before? Aisha Evans is a young um, woman, a mother who um, was from New York originally. And during the time that there were um, some protests happening at the killing of Alton Sterling, Alton Sterling um, was a black man in Baton Rouge who was killed by Baton Rouge police. Um, He was shot from about three feet away six times. And there were some protests after this happened. And Aisha Evans was a woman who came all the way from New York to participate in these demonstrations. And as I thought about Palm Sunday, and I thought about Jesus and his very intentional act of a procession that countered the procession of Rome, I thought of this image. Because in many ways, her actions are not that far off from those of Jesus on Palm Sunday. Her actions were one of peaceful resistance. Her actions were a critique of those with power. And her actions actually expose the excessive force and violence of those in charge. Her actions were meant to make kind of shame of the police, just like Jesus wanted to make shame of Rome. And on this Palm Sunday, and as I was thinking about this image, I realized, you know, it, it's not always easy to talk about these things in church and from the pulpit. Although our church talks about you know, being political but not partisan, I often feel this sort of tension of, oh gosh, I need to keep politics out of the pulpit. (laughs) And the truth is, a lot of us don't want to hear about this side of Jesus. We don't want to hear about Jesus who plans and participates in an act of nonviolent resistance. We don't want to hear about Jesus critiquing the Roman military and the Roman Empire. We don't want to hear about Jesus challenging Roman authority and rulers with a countercultural way. We don't want to hear about Jesus giving power and voice to the marginalized and the oppressed. We don't want to hear about these things. When we come to church, we actually often want to just have this picture that we're familiar with. The humble Jesus riding on a donkey, offering salvation to his people. But the reality is when we think about Jesus' actions in light of the political backdrop and the context that he lived in, there was so much more to what he was doing. There was so much more to his ministry than we could imagine. For me, I've been in church, I've been a Christian for pretty much all my life, and um, hearing this this side of the story, hearing about how Jesus' actions were kind of an act of protest against Rome, this was the first time even I have thought about this. How many of you have heard about the Roman procession before? Anyone heard of that before? Yeah, it was new to me. This is the first year that I actually learned about that side of the story. And the reality is that when we hear about the ministry of Jesus on that backdrop, we can't help but think about how revolutionary and challenging and disruptive his actions truly are. And this is why uh, Bonhoeffer says, Christianity stands or falls by its revolutionary protests against violence, arbitrariness, and pride of power. These are strong words, 
And this doesn't always feel like good news for us. We don't always want to hear about this revolutionary side of Jesus. We don't always want to be surprised by Jesus. We want to have the Jesus we can control. We want to be in the know. We want to know what to expect. We want to have the same kind of things that we've had before. And yet this, this Palm Sunday and this Holy Week, I believe that God has a message of challenge for us and an invitation for us to see things anew. It doesn't always feel safe. It doesn't always feel good. And yet, I believe that God is calling us to take part in what he's doing and to know that it's bigger than what we might expect. At the end of the passage that we read today, there's an interesting moment where the Pharisees actually say to Jesus, Jesus, tell your disciples to stop. Tell your disciples to stop. And I think that they knew that what Jesus was doing was dangerous, that what Jesus was doing was countering Rome, that what Jesus was doing was putting kind of a middle finger in the face of Rome and was putting the disciples kind of in danger. And they're saying, stop, don't do this. Don't put yourself in danger. Why would you confront Rome? Just leave things status quo. Just leave things as they are. Jesus, tell your disciples to stop. And yet Jesus, in all the ways that he defies our expectations, he cannot be stopped. He says, I tell you, even if they were silent, the stones would cry out. The stones would cry out. And the challenge for us today is to decide, are we going to be people on the side of the road, participating with Jesus in this act of nonviolent resistance, worshiping him as the true king, and, and saying that Rome is not? Or are we going to be like the Pharisees and say, stop. Stop talking about this radical nonsense. Stop talking about politics. Stop talking about all these things. Let's just leave things as they are. Why are you trying to change things? Why are you trying to mess things up? This is the challenge and question that I have before us today. First, present, we enter into Holy Week this week. I want to challenge us to see Holy Week through new eyes. Jesus was executed on the cross. And he defies our expectations. And I want to challenge us as we enter into Holy Week to see with new eyes, to see the potentially revolutionary nature of Jesus' actions. Let us not be satisfied this week with just singing the same songs, the waving of palms, the same old, same old. Let us not be satisfied with the typical routine of Holy Week activities and let the story feel too old or too familiar. Let us not be satisfied with the story of the cross and resurrection that speaks no good news to the force of evil, injustice, violence, and oppression in our world. Let us not forget that the path to victory and resurrection goes through the pain and the despair and the affliction of the cross. Let us remember this week that the actual ministry of Jesus was far riskier than we might imagine. It was far more confrontational. It was far more political. It was far uh, beyond our expectations. And my prayer and hope is that as we enter into Holy Week, as we go through Good uh, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Resurrection Sunday, that we would see with new eyes that Jesus would surprise surprise us and that we would be okay with not always being in the know and not always being in control. Let me pray for us. Jesus, we want to know you more. We want to worship you fully. And we do not want to be part of the wrong procession. Teach us how to see you for who you truly are and not just who we expect you to be. Give us courage. Give us open hearts. Would you move in us by your Holy Spirit this Holy Week? and make us new. We look to you. We look to your cross. 
and we declare that we need you. We need you, and we want to be more like you, Jesus. Teach us how to do that. Be with each person here this week. Would you bless our holy week with the gift of surprise? Would you defy our expectations and show us the story in new ways this week? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.